Good afternoon and welcome to our New York Archives Magazine online speaker series. I'm Josie Madison, editor of New York Archives. Today, we are joined by Archives Partnership Trust Steward, Richard Comstock, retired Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, and Chuck Bayless, former U.S. Army Green Beret and founder and executive director of the Military History Society of Rochester. Recently retired New York State Archivist Tom Reller will MC our program today, New York's Contribution in Foreign Wars. Richard Comstock will walk us through New York State's long contribution to America's war efforts, including mentioning the infamous Black soldiers nicknamed the Harlem Hellfighters and the famous Lost Battalion. He'll discuss the federalization of New York National Guard's people as seen through his grandfather's mobilization. Chuck Bayless will inform us on the important, transformed, and surprising roles of Rochester businesses during the World Wars. Thomas J. Ruller recently retired from his position as New York State Archivist, a role he has held since 2015. An active professional for 35 years, he's the author of several peer-reviewed journal articles and reviews on the use of technology in archives and the preservation of records in electronic form. Tom has been a consultant for several state governments and other organizations focusing on electronic records management and preservation. He remains actively engaged as a board member and steward of the Archives Partnership Trust. For those of you who have joined us today, welcome. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so you can feel free to submit your questions as they come to you using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many of those at the end of the presentation as we can. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Richard Comstock, Chuck Bayless, and Tom Roller. Thank you, Josie. Chuck, Richard, it's great to see both of you again. Um, I'm, this is going to be a really exciting and interesting and I think very informative program. And it's going to I hopefully teach people a whole lot about the relationship of our state government to the federal government, particularly in the area of national defense. It's not just about sending men, it's also and people. It's also about sending material and supporting the nation's effort to defend itself um, and to bring democracy uh, around the the globe. And you can see a lot of that relationship and the evolution of the relationship through the, the relationship of the National Guard and the relationship of communities across the state in supporting the war effort. World War II is a perfect model, and I'm really excited to hear what Chuck has to say about it. Um, Richard, I think you've got a PowerPoint, which I think is a very good way to help people understand the sort of the evolution and the relationship of the National Guard uh, to the federal service. A lot of folks don't realize and recognize that so many of the states of, of the war efforts, both domestic, the Civil War, but also um, in the War of 1812, uh, but also uh, the World War II and the Spanish-American War really started with state level efforts and state forces really being mobilized and, and deployed and ultimately federalized. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna fire up a PowerPoint and let you sort of walk us through how all that happens and then illuminate us a little bit more about the experience of your grandfather. So with that, um, I'm gonna see if I can make the magic happen uh, with the technology. Ah, lovely. <clears throat> um, I, I think my my interest in going what I'll call going deeper into this subject is is uh, was sparked a, a, starting about a year and a half ago with a uh, a, a online uh, discussion that I did with a gentleman by the name of Richard Barbudo, who wrote a very impressive book called New York's War of 1812. And in that, he uh, he outlined, and to my horror, the fact that that a, a war conducted by the United States uh, didn't involve the entire population. So for example, uh, the militia in the state of Massachusetts for economic reasons refused to participate in the, in the war effort. But what that did for me was outline or emphasize the fact that that there were there there were state militia and there were U.S. 
uh, uh, military and and the state militia were controlled by the by the states and 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 uh, uh, that relationship uh, fascinated me um, and and I I continued to to look into the War of eighteen twelve and and not only uh, as it related to the to the Western campaigns but also and more importantly because of where I'm from in the metropolitan New York area uh, the the emphasis on harbor defense and and how the militia effectively controlled or maintained defensive posture in 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 the New York area um in the in the in the late 1800s uh next slide if you would um in in the late 1800s the um uh the New York guard if you will was uh, uh somewhat of a of a uh uh <laughs> A primitive by our standards group of, of of folks but they were they they were uh designed to 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 uh, accomplish certain objectives and in in the in our in the metropolitan new york area and chuck can talk a little bit more about western new york but in the metropolitan area a lot of it had to do with harbor defense however there were a number of infantry units stationed and 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 housed in in the new york metropolitan area as well but the one i'm most more familiar with obviously is is the harbor defense and i trace its lineage to the war of 1812 and even before that um so so for example uh I, I will introduce my my grandfather quickly uh by by saying he's number 1 on the on the slide that you're looking at his brother-in-law is number 3 um and and they were they were um uh, uh this this taken unfortunately they didn't put the date on this but it was taken a, in just after the Spanish American War my grandfather was a private at that time and this was before uh the uh anything happened in in, in with regard to to World War 1 but there were established a number of forts around the metropolitan area which the New York guard militia uh manned and they included Fort Totten, Fort Tilden. Fort Totten was in in Queens, Fort Tilden in in Brooklyn, uh Fort Hancock was in Highlands, New Jersey, and and Fort Wright was in HG Wright was in Fisher's Island. And they were they were manned mostly by by uh militia and and they uh uh continued um to to thrive uh up until the, the second world war up to the, and through the second world war uh regiments in 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 these eras and if you can go to the next slide please regiments in these areas were were a combination of of military units and social uh gatherings there there you notice that this man this general who uh who i have yet to figure out who he is but he was in my grandfather's collection uh you'll notice his, his he was part of the new york militia but you'll notice that his hat insignia is the the seal of new york state not necessarily the seal of the united states and that's important the the medals that he is wearing are basically medals that are either awarded by the new york state or medals that are awarded by his unit which was the 13th uh regiment and that was a coast artillery regiment you'll notice right under the arrow there's a coast artillery pin on his um on his uh jacket which indicates that he's a coast artilleryman. Uh, many of the units in metropolitan New York were were disparagingly or or somewhat uh, 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 jeal in a fit of jealousy called silk stocking organizations. They were very social. Uh, they had they had everything from from retirement parties to testimonials to going away for any kind of an excuse they'd have a holiday they would have a they would have a a, a grand ball uh, or or some sort of grand uh, what what is later became known as a dining in um, but uh, my grandfather uh, enlisted uh, next slide please my grandfather enlisted in in uh, this hold on for this for a second but my grandfather listed in in april of 1898 in the new york guard and basically from there he he volunteered which you could do in those days he volunteered to 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 uh join uh the 22nd volunteers to fight in the spanish-american war 
and he did. He was he was federalized into the and assigned to the 22nd Volunteer, and and served there until uh, from from May. He was only in the New York militia for for a month from April to May, and then he effectively went into the to the uh, volunteer the 22nd Volunteers and served in 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 the in Cuba uh, during the Spanish American War. Six months later, in November, he he was discharged from from active duty, or uh, and and basically returned to the guard, and he remained in the guard and and stayed in service until 1916. Um, but what we're going to do is 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 stop for a second, and I want to back up. You'll notice the date on this. A couple of things to notice here. One is that that this is a a um, a a, a certificate of, of of designation of my grandfather as a first lieutenant in the Coast Artillery Corps in the National Guard of New York. Um, and and it date is to is 1906. And and the significance of a couple of things. Number one, the headings, people of the state of New York. Number two, you'll notice it's signed by Charles Evan Hughes, who those few students of history might remember that Charles Evan Hughes was not only the governor of the state of New York, but he also was a, on the Supreme Court at one point in time. Very, very well known uh, 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 jurisprudence, uh, 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 ju uh, student of jurisprudence, and uh, I might say a graduate of Cornell University Law School. Anyway, um, yay. Uh, but but the but the point here is the 1906 is significant because things happened between the end of the Spanish American War and 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 1906 and and basically Charles Dick who was a congressman in in, in the in in the U.S. Uh, pushed through uh, the Dick Act which basically for the first time said okay we're going to take state militias and we're going to separate them we're going to separate them into active militia and reserve militia. And the active militia will have uh, additional training opportunities. They will have additional funding opportunities and they will have a, 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 a prospect of being called to active duty uh, in the event of a national emergency for a period of nine months. That was their, their service commitment if they were. Um, and, and effectively uh, the Dick Act uh, basically said that that we want to eliminate the nine months and basically allow you to go overseas no matter what and and it wouldn't have to be just nine months so that was the first step in terms of 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 changing the the complexion if you will of 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 the the new york militia and and all the state militias but obviously it had an impact in new york so what what would happen now is that my my grandfather now was was made a first lieutenant in the Coast Artillery of the National Guard of New York, active, not reserve. So he now became an active uh, a player in the state of New York in 1906. It took a few years to get going. The next step was the National Defense Act of, of uh of 1916, and I might back up by saying one of the reasons that that the 1903 legislation went through was because it was clear from the Spanish American War that that the 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 armed forces of, of or at least the army of of the United States was poorly trained, poorly manned, and and under under provided for in terms of uh, weaponry and 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 all any kind of of of, of support. Uh, so th there was a need to 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 ramp up the National Defense Act of 1916 increased the number of 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 drills that a, a militia would an active militia would be uh, responsible for from 24 to 48 established a 15 day summer camp um, um, uh, requirement and basically um they they uh, also provided for interestingly enough ROTC um and so that the that was that was a big deal in in 1916 and of course it was kind of a, a prelude to what was to come and and that was the they 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 knew there was a need to get the people ramped up and get soldiers ramped up for for something that was going to happen and and from there jumping to to July of 1916 in New York City 
uh, there was not a, a, a great understanding of what was going on in Europe. But in, in July of 1916, there was a significant explosion in Jersey City uh, where a warehouse went up in smoke and, and engulfed most of the city for a period of a few days. It was called the Black Tom explosion. And the explosion really was an explosion of munitions that the, the United States was providing and, and sending to Europe in support of, of, the, of, of the, uh, the French and, and British forces over there. And, and it, it was the first wake up call to New York that we actually were involved, albeit not involved in, in, in the actual fighting, but um, we uh, were involved in the, in the, uh, um, in, in the war in, in one way, shape or form. Um, in New York, among other, uh, in New York, as well as for uh, three other states, um, what we can tend to know as the Plattsburgh movement was established in 1915. And what it was designed to do was to train officers, uh, indoctrination, uh, basically orientation, indoctrination into uh, the the rules, uh, the conduct of 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 military forces and and training or indoctrinating leaders into 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 the military a number of of very well known uh folks went to uh the Plattsburgh camp which was set up in in obviously in Plattsburgh New York as part of this this op, op uh, uh opportunity if you will to train officer material uh both of Roosevelt's sons Quentin and Theodore Jr went uh, the mayor of New York, John Mitchell, went, uh, and and two two gentlemen who we'll talk about in a little bit, a fellow by the name of Charles Whittlesey, and a fellow by the name of George McMurtry. Uh, Charles Whittlesey is probably the more well known. Um, he was a, a Williams graduate, Harvard Law, was a successful lawyer in New York, and and went to the went to the Plattsburgh uh, 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 orientation camp. And uh, uh, later we'll talk about as part of uh, what we call the the uh, uh, Empire Division or the uh, I'm sorry the the Metropolitan Division. Um, so anyway, uh, when war was declared, uh, basically my 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 grandfather. Next slide, please. When war was uh, uh, back up, th this is this is my grandfather in in a local newspaper. Uh, he was a surgeon in the Spanish War. He was actually a, he he was a hospital assistant in the Spanish American War, and he wanted to go fight in Mexico. Believe it or not, and this was this was an article that basically told the story about how he wanted to leave his his company and go fight in in the uh, the the uh, the war in, in in Mexico that was going on that you know Pershing was involved with and what have you but but that was that was his his uh, um that was his uh uh opportunity as he saw it he never went because uh soon thereafter we got involved with something else next slide please um once the the a National Defense Act of 1916 and the the draft of 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 or in recruitment, if you will, of of New York and and other state militias into active service for for the uh, uh, for the war. Um, New York insignia and I'm assuming other states did the same. Uh, superimposed the New York on the U.S. insignia, which was worn on their on their collars originally, and then on their lapels. Uh, in in certain, depending upon the uniform they were they were uh, wearing. Uh, this this is my one of my grandfather's uh, uh, lapel uh, insignia, and uh, uh, prior to that, his insignia just said New York, and, and now it it said New York superimposed on the U.S. Um, getting back to to um, the the um, uh, World War One and his or in, in indoctrination into World War One, as I think I mentioned, he was part of the Thirteenth Regiment uh, in 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 uh, Brooklyn. Uh, at, but in at, at the outset of the war, he was reassigned from the Thirteenth Regiment and was assigned to to South Carolina to serve as uh, uh in the medical corps 
uh, as part of, and now he, he was a first lieutenant. Uh, and you can see now he doesn't have the NYs on his US, but they he does have uniforms with that on. Um, but he went he went to serve in the 30th Division, which was organizing itself in, in South Carolina. Uh, in, in preparation to, to go overseas. He was no longer, he was now a part of the federal army and he was, he was going, going to war. The, the 13th regiment, which had been primarily a coast artillery regiment, many of those people were taken piecemeal to other units and the remainder of that unit, the 13th regiment went to, to, to Europe and, and fought as, as the 59th artillery. Um, the to get back to the 77th when war was declared in in april of 1917 whittlesley uh went, went to camp was was obviously joined the military went to camp upton in long island to train to what was become the 77th division uh it was a national army not a state guard and it was a very diverse group. It was primarily uh, composed of New Yorkers. Um, most of the of the uh, uh, of, of the population of of the of the organ of the uh, division was from metropolitan New York. And you can imagine that that created some issues because New York City, metropolitan New York, was a very diverse community. It had a, a large immigrant population from all corners of, of the globe and primarily uh, Europe and the the loyalties of, of various individuals that might be part of this division were, were always uh, uh, <laughs> in question. So um, the, 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 the organization itself tried to identify people who were of of less um, um, uh, uh, le le less reliable from a from a loyalty standpoint. Um, the um, next slide, please. This um, prior to my grandfather's reassignment, if you will, to to the thirtieth division. This was sort of a, an announcement that his company, which was part of the New York Coast Artillery uh, was indeed uh, a part of and and going to uh, participate in 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 a in a in the conflict in the World War. Uh, that didn't happen for him because, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon you how you look at it, he was a um, he was a doctor at that time. He had uh, he had gotten his medical degree and so was was sent down to to uh, South Carolina to join the 30th. So he did not end up with his 13th regiment. Next slide. Um, he, he, he left and, and the, the 30th, uh, along with uh, a number of the other uh, units um, of in, in the in, uh, National Guard units, if you will, the 30th left uh, or arrived in, in, uh, in Europe in, in May of, of 1918. Put in perspective, the 27th also arrived in, in I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, in May of 1918, I'm getting them all. And uh, so anyway, uh, the the both units uh, seem to arrive at roughly the same time. Although the 30th was not deemed to be a New York unit, um, he was a New York person. He he was assigned to to a a, a, a hosp field hospital in the 105th Sanitary Train. They called it, and that was his map. That's his map of Belgium and France, and in it he details areas where they were located, where they would bivouac, where they would set up their hospital, and where the bad guys and where the good guys were. And that was his that was his his field map. Um, next slide. This was an armband worn by him, George S. Comstock, in France and Belgium in July and August of, of 1918. Uh, I've included some of his extra paraphernalia, but obviously the, the medical corps uh, insignia and his marksmanship uh, badge I, I simply pinned on. But the, the armband was the armband that, that he wore and subsequently um, uh, uh, an annotated for lack of a better word. Next slide. Um, this again is an, another armband that that 
details his medical army medical service and uh, another one and in showing him having been in Marne, France in June and July of, of 1918, and then Belgium in uh, July and August of 18. He was wounded and gassed in in, in August of, of 1918 and evacuated uh, and through France and went to uh, uh, a hospital in, in, in Belgium, uh, I mean, in uh, England uh, to recover. And from there came back to the United States in 1919. Next slide. This is kind of what I've collected uh, of of his um, of his uh, uh, insignia. The two round uh, uh, items are are his dog tags. Um, the the red uh, uh, insignia or patch up at the top is the 30th division. Um, there was a question of whether that it should be worn horizontally or vertically, but no, uh, I think most wore it horizontally, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that th this is uh, uh, what I was able to unearth from from his uh, his collection of of stuff. But uh, anyway, and he did earn the chevrons uh, as part of his uh, his uh, uh, service in in World War One. So you can see the the uh, other thing I wanted to point out was notice the U.S. insignia. Instead of having New York, it has NG, and um, it 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 kind of tells you that that he was identified not only as a New York guy but as a as a National Guardsman. Um, the New York insignia, the one on, to the right of that, you can see it was the New York insignia that they wore prior to that that time. Um, the I I put this in as as a it, it there are this is a book that was published in in 1920 that basically uh, uh, nothing it says it all these are stories written by soldiers who fought over there very very heartfelt um, some funny some not so funny but there they were they were there uh, and and they they told the tale. Um, it, it is a it's a wonderful book to read, um, and I I was very happy to be able to have done it. Um, I want to get back to New York and and the seventy seventh a little bit more. Um, the, Charles Whittlesey, as you know, was the was the was the uh, uh, face of the Lost Battalion um, after Camp Upton. Um, they they did leave for Europe. Um, in April of, of 1918, um, they right around the time that the 27th was leaving uh, and the time that that the uh, 30th down in, in South Carolina was leaving. Um, and and they again, they were were deployed early. Uh, they they fought in a number of of of, of conflicts uh, and and. Again, they were they were a military a U.S. Army organization, but they were they were um, uh, made up mostly of New Yorkers. Finally, I think it's important to just remember that there is another division that was associated with New York, but not necessarily from New York. And that's the 42nd Division. I was a part of the 42nd Division at one time, and it was it's viewed today as a New York division or was viewed as a New York division. But in in World War One, the 42nd was was not a New York division. It was made up of of units, militia units from all over the United States. And Douglas MacArthur suggested, who was the chief of staff at the time, suggested it might be called the Rainbow Division because the rainbow extends from one coast to another. And, and it became the Rainbow Division at that point. Um, the other thing is that I, I the other point I would make is that, that um, these divisions usually included all the population, particularly the 77th uh, of Metro New York, except for black soldiers. And the black soldiers were not part of the of the organizations that were so constituted, but they were they they ended up becoming a part of of the uh, what's known as the Harlem Hellfighters and the 93rd Division, 369th in, uh, Battalion in the 93rd Division became known as the Harlem Hellfighters. They went to overseas as well. And, and and many of them um, uh, 
uh, fought with the French uh, at, at, again because of of, uh, of our history of 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 segregation at that time. Uh, but they that they distinguished themselves in combat and made a lot of friends with with the French folks. So it was a it was a a, a great um, uh, a, a, a great experience for them and a great feather in their cap. Um, I think that. Uh, probably is enough to, <laughs> to keep you all uh, in, in the game. Um, but I think that that I, I was blessed by a, a, a large volume of, of memorabilia, but cursed by the fact that it really didn't get terribly well organized. But I, I think I pieced together the fact that that the the system had evolved over a long period of time and and it, it became uh, by 1933, uh, well, actually, by 1922, uh, National Guardsmen were paid from New York, from the uh, United States coffers. And by 1933, um, the there was a clear recognition that a guardsman had two responsibilities and effectively had two lines of chains of command, one through its state and a state adjutant general, and one up through the military organization in, of, the U, of the United States Army. And, um, and I think that was other than 1947, when the, um, the Air Force was incorporated into the, into the uh, uh, National, uh, National Guard, if you will, Air Force incorporated into the U.S. Army or U.S. Uh, uh, Armed Forces. Uh, it, it, that was pretty much by 1933, it was pretty much uh, accomplished. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you. I think what's what's really fascinating is the, the fact that you were able to sort of just do this archaeology about your grandfather, but put it into this broader context of the you know, he was a New York National Guardsman. And that's what is that he started off that way and ended that way. But as you were very well said, they have two responsibilities or two chains of command uh, that and and that's that's how New York n contributes to the national defense and that that incredibly strong relation. We all have those relatives who are were in the guard, but in it now in the even the, in the past uh, twenty years, with so many guard units being mobilized to go overseas um, in support of national efforts, it's a it's a great story that we all can connect to through individuals that are part of our families or part of our ancestry. It's really, really incredible. At the State Archives, we have a wonderful collection of personal war stories around World War I of individuals uh, who contributed their own story of what happened during the war. It was all done after the war and all those folks came back. And it was a really great resource for providing the both the understanding of the federal state relationship but also to explore the individual experiences of New Yorkers a, across the state. Um, and uh, that's that's a great set of, of records that I think a lot of people don't necessarily know we have, um, but I think get a fair amount of use. And some of it's available um, via our, our website. On the other side of the coin, though, there is a lot about what happened in New York and New York's role in foreign wars in terms of the delivery of materiel and delivery of ideas and inventions that helped win the war. You know, I grew up in Gloversville, uh, where the glove industry really was marshaled to pro provide a lot of clothing, uh, gloves, uh, bomber jackets, all of that sort of seats and other equipment for particularly for uh, the Air Corps. Um, but Ilian, New York, uh, a, a great story there uh, about the manufacture of munitions. Um, every corner of the state, there's something that was was manufactured. We were talking before the program started about the manufacture of compasses in New York City. But Chuck, there's a lot that happened just in Rochester, and a lot that really enabled, particularly during World War II, um, the, the Allies to be victorious, and a lot of stories that none of us necessarily know. So can I turn this one over to you, and uh, you can share with us that and, and enlighten us about what did Kodak do during the war, maybe even? <laughs> sure. And that was just one 
one of the companies. <laughs> right. So we are a Military History Society of Rochester. We have our charter from Board of Regents State of New York as a historical society with collections and a federal 501c3. <clears throat> We've been, uh, we were founded 15, 16 years ago and have built up a collection that covers from War of 1812 up through current times. And what we've tried to do is to bring in as much local history as we can. And we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, as we go through the slides, uh, what you will see is a lot of the items from our collection and they are indicated by a logo, you know, which I'll point out as we get to, uh, to one of the slides. So we're we'll be talking about Monroe County Industries and their contributions to the war effort. So Monroe County, upstate New York, not a large uh, county when you look at New York State in total. However, a huge amount of innovative uh, industry was located here. Start off, Bosch and Loam, they were formed in 1853. Actually, Henry Loam served in the Civil War as an officer, but their huge contribution was they were the first uh, company to make usable optical glass in the United States. Prior to that, all of the optical glass came from Germany. And of course, when World War I broke out, that supply very much ended very quickly. So because of that, there was a huge optics industry. Bosch and Loam, Gunlatch Manhattan, Crown Optical, and Wollensack were four of the companies that actually made binoculars you know, during World War I. And down at the lower right of that uh, uh, of photograph, there is our logo. When you see that, these are items that belong to our collection. The Naval Gun Factory Annex nationalized Crown Optical in 1917. The Naval Gun Factory out of Washington was responsible, of course, for much of the Navy gear. And Crown Optical was having their problems. They had contracts with the Navy and they were having their problems. So in 1917, the Nas uh, Naval Gun Factory sent their folks up and actually nationalized it to be able to produce the material that they were being contracted for. This particular item is called a statometer. And see there is a lens that one would look through and on the corners, there are three points. What you would do is to line up the ship on the three points and then you could read the distance on the scale on the side. Wollensack, again, company formed in 1899. This is a trench periscope. And of course, with trench warfare, you didn't want to stick your head up over the top to see what was going on. So this was one that was used quite, quite frequently by officers, especially to determine if the coast was clear or whatever. They also made uh, the trench periscopes for artillery uh, use as well. This is Bosch and Loam, this is Rangefinder. And they made a tremendous number of these. You know, the largest one weighed over 14 tons. But again, these were used, you know, as spotters. They were used by the Navy and by the Army and field to, to range for their uh, artillery bombardments. Stromberg Carlson. 1894. This is a buzzer from uh, World War I. Again, basically it was a telegraph key and they would string wire and that was one of the main 
ways that they did uh, communications. Stromberg made a lot of, of radios and uh, different uh, gear for uh, home use. But again, during the war, changed into doing uh, items for, for the military. The Taylor Instruments. This is a World War I compass. And this one had uh, a glow in the dark dial and they had a tendency to kind of uh, name theirs a little off the wall in a way. And this particular one is called Use at Night because once again, you could see the, uh, the letters and read the uh, compass and during nighttime. Cunningham Car Company, you know, was a buggy company that was formed in 1836 and produced cars from 1896 to 1931. It was a, uh, they produced uh, ambulances during World War I and sent several thousand of them overseas. Uh, when I was in college, I worked at Kodak and I had a supervisor who told me a story about his father who had been uh, a friend of George Eastman. He was a uh, machinist at Cunningham and George Eastman asked him if he would come to work for Eastman. And he said, no, he didn't think so because he thought Cunningham had a much better uh, future for him. This is Selden Motor Vehicle Company. And from 1907 to 1914, they produced cars. From 1913 to 1932, produced trucks. They produced thousands of these Liberty trucks. A good portion of them went into, uh, into Russia because at that time, Russia had very, very little industry. So Rochester produced a lot of those. It's interesting that actually Selden had the patent on motor vehicles. And he was the first. And of course, Henry Ford produced the largest number. They had a dispute over the, the patents. And unfortunately, uh, Ford had far more money than Selden had. So he never got much out of it. Although he did hold a patent for the original motor car. Symington Company made munitions during World War I. And again, tons and tons of them and all different varieties. But also General Ra Railway Signal, which was formed in 1904. And it, once again, this was a company that made uh, railroad stuff, but yet they, they changed over to manufacturing munitions. And you can see from in the photograph, you know, huge quantities of munitions were produced. At the beginning of World War I, uh, the Army Air Corps was just being formed and aviation was just coming in. And it was decided by George Eastman that there should be a uh, school of aerial photography. However, the military was not interested in actually doing that. They thought they had better things to do. So George had, with his own money, actually formed the school, but then eventually it was incorporated into the U.S. Army Air Corps and helped to train, you know, the uh, aerial photographers who did a lot of reconnaissance work during World War uh, I. This is one of the Kodak aerial cameras that they built and they did a whole variety of different ones. You know, many of them were, again, different uh, styles. You know, the one on the, the far right was called a gun camera for obvious reasons. But again, a whole variety of different kinds of, of cameras were made for different purposes. But Kodak was not the only one that actually made uh, cameras as well. Graflex uh, did, Graflex was originally a division of Kodak, but was spun off because of, um, uh, during the, the purge of, of corporations that were getting too powerful. 
This is a Kodak vest pocket camera. And this was not necessarily a military item, but it was actually called the vest pocket camera because when it was folded up, it could actually fit in the vest pocket of a uh, World War I uniform. And with photography just coming into real, real wide acceptance, Kodak did advertising for that. It said, take a Kodak with you. Now, I kind of wondered about this particular photograph because where did he actually uh, process that film that he's looking at? So apparently they must have had processing labs with them, you know, somewhere in, uh, uh, in the theater as well. But it was not just the United States. This is a ad from New Zealand that the gift he will most appreciate is a soldier's Kodak. So take a Kodak with you so you can bring pictures home. Monroe County in 1940 had a population of about 438,000. 42,000 know, actually served in the military. So that was one in 10. However, on the home front, there was 120,000 workers in the defense industry. So that was almost one in four of everyone who in Rochester who and Monroe County who actually worked in the defense industry. And out of that, there were 48,000 women who actually uh, worked in defense plants. Because obviously with the, the men being gone, they had to be taken up by someone. And so a lot of women a lot of handicapped and a lot of minorities actually filled the ranks of the workers. During World War II, uh, the Army and Navy issued what were called E awards, and they were awards for excellence. And in Monroe County, we had 64 different companies that won 114 different awards for different items and for different production goals that they met. Kodak, of course, you know, was one in the forefront. And in this particular one, they dressed up as they put it, they put their civilian miniature in uniform. And they had a whole series of cameras that actually were put into Olive Drab to be part of the, of the military complex. This is a Kodak uh, film camera, movie camera. These were adapted to uh, use for periscope cameras and submarines. They were used for all kinds of uses during uh, World War II. The magazine, you know, which is a film cartridge magazine, was used in a variety of, of uh, cameras, including most of the gun cameras that were uh, placed on airplanes. And so all those films that one might see of combat action in aircraft were all shot with Kodak film. Kodak made a lot of, uh, of instruments for aircraft. This one is a what was called a drift meter. And so this would allow them to, to uh, see how far port to starboard they were drifting if they were drifting off course. And again, so many of the uh, the aircraft of the day did not have the sophisticated instruments that we had today and relied far more on visual uh, uh, sightings as they, the ones today really rely on instrumentation. So this might've been a rather crude one, but again, was very, something that was very important. Another one of the uh, items that Kodak made for uh, aircraft was called an astrograph. And so what this was, this was for open ocean navigation. It would be hung up above the maps that they were uh, using you know, for their navigation. And it had film cartridges that would project the projections of the constellations upon the map 
to help them determine where in the open ocean they, they were, since obviously you had no landmarks. So this was obviously a huge uh, innovation for that time. But also, Kodak made hand grenades. And this particular one, the T-13, was one that was uh, requested by the OSS. Kodak did a lot of works. You know, they had a one facility they called the Skunk Works, where nobody really knew all of what was going on. But the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, wanted a hand grenade that would explode on contact. And Kodak worked on trying to have that, you know, make something that would actually work. However, it was never really successful because, you know, in testing, a hard shake sometimes would be enough to set it off. And of course, if you happen to pull the pin and drop it in front of you, there you go. But during testing, <clears throat> it got, it was nicknamed the Beano. And according to urban legend, it received that name because during testing, someone threw one up in the air, it came down, hit him on the head, so he'd be no more. But Kodak also was one of the developers of the radio proximity fuse. <clears throat> and the importance of that was that prior to the proximity fuses coming into play, the gunners on the ground for anti-aircraft had to guess at how high the uh, planes were, were flying and set the fuse to go off at that altitude and then try and get them to a point where they would intercept a plane as they were coming in. And of course, all of that was extremely difficult. With the radio proximity fuse, a radio wave would be sent off <clears throat> as they were you know, going through the air. And when a wave hit a, a, a plane and bounced back, then it would explode. <clears throat> so one of the difficulties in, in doing that was designing components that could actually withstand the shock of being fired out of a gun, but yet still be accurate enough to be able to receive back you know, those uh, transmissions. And they've said that uh, in the Pacific theater, that over 90% of the kamikazes were brought down by uh, aerial proximity fuses. Again, extremely important development, you know, during uh, World War II. The Norton bomb site, which was the bomb site that was used in all the heavy bombers, you know, and medium bombers, uh, also. Kodak, Bosch and Lohm, and Wolensack all helped to design some of the components and built components for uh, optical components for the bomb sites themselves. Uh, Kodak's Hawkeye plant machine casings, you know, for the football, which is the portion on the top. And it also has been said, although we can't, we don't know for sure, but they also did some assembly work, you know, for, for the, uh, the Norden as well. Bosch and Lam and Rochester Optical both made aviator glasses. <clears throat> Bosch and Lohm, of course, had the Ray-Bans, which were, you know, their trademark. But Rochester Optical Company also made uh, thousands of pairs of glasses. They are still in, in business today and still produce uh, eyewear. Schlegel Manufacturing Company was made web, webbing prior to World War uh, One or World War Two, <clears throat> and during the, in the first part of the war, the machine gun belts were made out of web material. Later during the war, they were uh, changed and they were metal links. But during the early part of the war, Schlegel made again hundreds and thousands of machine gun belts for both 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns. B-29 was of course a, a big improvement in Air Corps during 
uh, World War II. It was the first pressurized uh, bomber that was, was produced. And it had uh, turrets that were remote, remotely controlled rather than being controlled by a bomber sit, uh, sitting with them. Uh, General Way, Way Signal, which again made munitions during World War I, helped to develop and design the top turrets for the B-29 bombers. This is a, one of the instruments. This is a, a munitions counter, you know, which would uh, keep track of how many rounds were being fired since again, you weren't visually being able to see, see what, they, uh, what they were using. Stromberg Carlson, which did the uh, buzzers in World War I, now made uh, radios. This is a one that was used in, uh, again, the heavy bombers and light uh, medium bombers. But also for the Navy, this is a voice activated telephone. And so again, an innovation for that time and was probably used on the vast majority of ships that the Navy had produced during uh, World War II. Sergeant Greenleaf was another company. Again, things that you wouldn't really think about. They produced military grade locks. These were case hardened. They had uh, very uh, complex cylinders in them you know, used in protection with being case hardened, they were very difficult, you know, to cut and were very, very difficult, you know, to, to pick. The current versions of this particular lock are probably in the six to $7,000 range per lock. Again, very extent, uh, expensive pieces, but again, uh, protected a lot of our own equipment. Stecker Trong Schmidt Corporation, produced uh, hundreds of thousands of maps during uh, World War II. Uh, prior to that, they were uh, at the turn of the century, they were the largest producer of seed packets in the country. Rochester had a huge nursery industry and many, many apple strains were actually uh, produced here. You know, or, and there was a large number of nurseries that grew seed stock. Stecker Trongschmidt made a great number of those packets that uh, for seed distribution. Symington Gould, which was uh, came after uh, the Symington Corporation, they were makers of tank, ship, railroad parts, and different and different munitions. Huge, huge factory, which is now very large art complex in, in Rochester and an interesting use of, uh, of the building afterwards. This is an interesting one, N.J. Carl and Son. They made these brushes that would clean the uh, firing pin holes on 50 caliber machine guns. They were the only ones in the country that made these brushes. So had they not been in business, Someone else would have had to make them, or all the uh, 50 caliber machine guns would have been inoperable, would have seized up. National Postal Meter, another company from Rochester, made M1 carbines. Carbines were designed at the beginning of World War II. The whole design took less than six months to develop, was designed by Winchester. These arms were used to replace pistols for people that didn't need a full-size battle rifle. Uh, it was lightweight, 30 caliber. Uh, during three and a half years, 6.2 million of them were made by 10 different civilian companies. National Poster Meter made 413,000 of those. The wood was not made by them, but was made by a company called Tremble Nursery Land. And prior to the war, they made nursery furniture. So for them, it was a big change in corporate uh, client because instead of making stuff sturdy, 
They needed to make things that were precise. Manufacturing the guns themselves, on the other hand, was again, just a manufacturing process, which again, National Postal Meter was doing. This is a photograph of the assembly line. And as you see, mostly women working on the line. So I'm sure that many of them, you know, when they went home at night, you know, well, I made guns today. So I helped to, uh, you know, helped our war effort. But they employed tremendous numbers of women as well, you know, during in manufacturing and inspection and even testing of the weapons themselves. Commercial controls, uh, four and a half million fuses, parts for uh, rifles, they were the parent company of National Postal Meter. And speaking of fuses, going back to, you know, this proximity fuses, fuses Kodak made over two and a half million of those during, during World War II. This is Robeson Knife Company. And prior to the war, they made cutlery, kitchen cutlery. This is uh, the M3 fighting knife issued to the uh, US Marine Corps. This is a Navy deck knife by Robeson. And again, thousands and thousands of these were made. The Navy, however, uh, wanted one that would be a little bit more substantial on deck because again, these are leather handles working in damp and wet weather. They had a tendency to deteriorate. So a company, a colonial knife company out of Providence, Rhode Island made this particular one. Now the local Rochester connection is that Kodak formulated and made the plastic for the handle. Rochester Fireworks Company produced all kinds of flares uh, for, uh, for military use. And of course they were used by both the Navy and, and on ground. Again, a very important part of, of, of our heritage. E.E. E. Fairchild, they were a manufacturer of cards and novelties and games. During World War II, they produced over a million decks of cards, you know, under the Haddon Hall name, which were distributed to uh, soldiers in both European and uh, Pacific theaters. Again, a good morale booster. The J.G. Menahan Shoe Factory uh, changed from making shoes into making leather flight helmets and other uh, leather goods, you know, for the military. Uh, however, they also made parachutes, and they made parachutes for both use for by crew, air crew members, and also for cargo parachutes. One of the interesting things about World War II is that, you know, if you were in an air, a part, member of the Air Corps, and if you were shot down and you had to parachute, you became a member of the Caterpillar Club. And we, according to speculation, you know, Caterpillar got named the Caterpillar Club because of hitting the silk. And that's what most of the parachutes were made out of. So not only did you get your your uh, your card as member of the Caterpillar Club, but you also got a pen that, to wear. And this is the one that was made for the Menahan Shoe Factory. The probably the most prolific of the manufacturers was a company called Swetlick uh, Parachute Company out of New Jersey. And this was the pen that they gave to those that used their parachutes. But they was made here in Rochester by the Metal Arts Company, who did tremendous numbers of medallions, of uh, insignia, of all kinds of metal castings. You know, they were a company that did a lot of gold and silver. Uh, the building itself is located in not a really great neighborhood, no indication on the building that 
of what they actually did inside. They didn't even have their name on the, the front of the, of the building. E.P. Reed Shoe Company. This, these are women's army shoes, you know, that were uh, made during World War II. They built their building in 1905, and it was an innovative building for the time. Two things made it so. One was it was the first uh, industrial building in Rochester to have uh, a sprinkler system. But more importantly, it was the first industrial building in Rochester to have enough indoor bathrooms for all their employees. The E.P. Reed Shoe Company has been transformed into artist studios and that's actually where our facility is located now. John H. Odenbach, he owned a company called Dolomite, which was a um, stone company. They had uh, made stone, crushed stone, that was used all up and down uh, New York State because our, the canal is here. It had uh, been used in making uh, uh, working with the um, canal and, and with the Thruway Authority. But so he was building barges to do those transports. But during World War II, he started the Odenbach Ship Factory, huge facility. And again, just remember the size of that length of that building, because what he did is he developed a method for making these coastal tankers. And the method that he used was to actually build them in sections and weld them together. They would have as many as three that were being manufactured at any one time coming down an assembly line. During World War II, they made 55 of these uh, Y boats or coastal tankers. Two of them are still sailing today in the country Greece. This is the Eugenia, which is under Greek registry and still is a tramp steamer in, uh, in the Mediterranean. In addition to that, they also made uh, steel barges and steel tugs. These were made by the Dutch for the Dutch government who used them as landing barges. So again, they made the propulsion and they made, you know, the uh, barge themselves. But they also made three or four of these large self-propelled oil tankers. Again, what was kind of interesting, you know, with these is that all four of them were sunk along the, uh, the East Coast by German submarines. Just... Rochester Products was a division of General Motors. This is a uh, oxygen flow indicator that was used on uh, bombers. Again, you know, they, in the beginning, they were not pressurized. So they had to make sure that oxygen was flowing through, you know, their, uh, to their oxygen mass. And again, this would actually help them determine to make sure that that was actually happening. Samson United, was a corporation that made curlers, hair curlers and toasting ovens uh, during uh, prior to the war. They received over $14 million in contracts during World War II. And in 1944, they re received a $103,000 contract, which was a classified army contract from various sources. Um, fairly certain that this is what they produced on this contract. This was an infrared reading device. And the University of Rochester Optics Lab was one of the developers of usable uh, infrared technology. According to the purpose of this, that when the troops landed on D-Day, you know, and Market Garden being not great navigators, you know, maps and weather being all factors, they could be scattered all over the place. So what they would do was send up a very strong infrared beam at the rally point 
And this is where they found where they were supposed to go. Taylor Instruments in World War II, still making uh, uh, their, uh, their instruments, uh, their compasses. This is a wrist compass that was used uh, by airborne troops. Woolen sack in World War II. Uh, these are two different uh, spy glasses, an officer of the deck spy glass and a quartermaster spy glass. Again, they made uh, thousands of these, you know, for the Navy. R.T. French, located in Rochester. In 1926, it was purchased by Coleman, who made all kinds of spices. Brasso was a European uh, product. And because they were taken over by uh, actually English product, since they were taken over by an English company, they became the distributors of, um, of Brasso during World War II, and their plant was located at One Mustard Street. Rochester Optical during uh, Vietnam War made these glasses with uh, changeable lenses for different uh, uh, uses for night, for glare, whatever. But again, they continued to produce items for uh, for the military even through the Vietnam era. Two companies made foot powder for Vietnam. And with that, that concludes you know, my part of the presentation. So again, we're located in Rochester. We're open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, noon to four. Our um, website, rochestermilitary.com. We hope to see some of you come and visit us. And thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Chuck. I think you can count on a, a number of people coming out. Um, maybe not until March or April, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that's, that's that presentation, again, as, as a New Yorker, a lifelong New Yorker, both of you, have made increased my pride in our state. You know, you you see those pictures of the war efforts. You know, from Detroit. You know, uh, Ford making planes and tanks and all that. That same thing happened here, all over the place. Rochester really uh, made a huge, huge impact. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I I really hope that people do get out to the Historical Society to kind of soak all that in and see some of the other great artifacts that are behind you right now. That That is that is great. And Richard, thank you for telling the story of your grandfather because it really, it illuminates for all of us the benefit and all that we can learn by understanding our relatives and understanding the past, our family's past. I did see in one of the questions, folks asked, can I look up information on my, my own ancestors at the State Archives? Yes, there's a name search on the uh, archives website. Um, all of our World War I service cards and all of our Civil War and uh, Spanish American War service records have all been digitized. And if you have a question, uh, just you can send an email to our reference desk and they'll help you figure it out. But I see Josie's back and we're getting close to being out of time. But uh, so Josie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that, for those great presentations. Um, I think it's, it, like Tom said, it's really amazing to think about um, just the enormity of the contributions of New Yorkers to, to war efforts. Um, so for those of you who might have been um, tickled into thinking about your own ancestors and how they might have uh, been involved in, in the military, um, the best place to start is at uh, the New York State Archives website, which is archives.nysed.gov. And like Tom said, there are a lot of resources there, but if you get stuck, you can always email somebody at the at the reference desk. Um, but thanks so much um, to both of our presenters today for such an insightful presentation. And thank you to, to those of you who joined us. And we, uh, our website for the Archives Partnership Trust is nysarchivestrust.org if you'd like to learn more about what we do. 
Um, if you're interested in the content we create and you would like to see some more, you can always email us at aptrust at nyse.gov and you can receive a free past issue of New York Archives Magazine. And I would like to commend to all of you our next online speaker series brought forth on this continent, Abraham Lincoln and American Immigration on February 15th at 1230. We'll be joined by Lincoln Scholar and Jonathan F. Fanton, Director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, Harold Holzer, for that program. And you won't want to miss it. So please check out our website to find out more and register nysarchivestrust.org. And again, thank you so much, Chuck, Richard, and Tom, for sharing all of your vast knowledge with us today. Thanks, Josie. Have a Bye, great everyone. day.